Nietzsche said that you could tell much about a man's character by how much truth he could tolerate, which is very interesting. You know, there's an, an idea in the great Western tradition that the truth is the way and the path of life and that no one comes to the Father except through the truth. And I believe that to be the case because I don't think that you can manifest who you are without the truth. And so I think it's, it's, it's literally and metaphorically true that the, the pathway to who you could be if you were completely who you were is through the truth. And so the truth does set you free, but the problem is, is that it destroys everything that isn't worthy in you as it sets you free. And that's, that's a process of burning. And it's, it's painful because you cling to what you shouldn't be, um, partly out of pride and partly out of ignorance and partly out of laziness. And, and so then you encounter something true. And you all know this. You all know this perfectly well because... When was the last time that you learned something important that wasn't a, a blow of, of some sort, you know? And, and it's often you look back at your life and you think, oh God, I really learned something there. I wouldn't want to do that again, but it really changed my life. I mean, sometimes it can really destroy you, you know, an encounter with the truth and you never really recover. But now and then something comes along and straightens you out and a lot of you has to go. A lot of you has to burn away, you know, and... and and I suppose in some sense, the idea is that everything about you that isn't worthy is to be put into the flames. You know, I learned when I was a kid, about 25 or so, a little older than a kid, that almost everything that I said was one form of lie or another. And I wasn't any worse, I would say, than the people that I was associating with or any better. And the lies were manifold, you know, they were attempts to win arguments for the sake of winning the argument, that might be one. Attempts to indicate my intellectual prowess when there were competitions of that sort. Maybe just the, um, the sheer pleasure of engaging in an intellectual argument and winning. My inability to distinguish between ideas that I had read and incorporated because I had read but hadn't realized that I hadn't yet earned the right to use all of that and you know I had this experience that lasted a long time while well, I would say it's really never gone away that and I think this was the awakening of my conscience and I didn't realize this until much later when I was reading Socrates apology this voice for lack of a better word made itself manifest inside me and it said every time I said something that wasn't true and that's usually what it said that's not true. You don't believe that. Or, or there was a sensation that was associated with it. I don't think this is that uncommon, you know. I asked my psychology classes for many years in a row if um, they had an experience, this experience, that they had a voice in their head, let's say, it's a metaphor, or a feeling uh, that communicated to them when they were about to do something wrong. And it was universally the case that people agreed with one of those statements or another and the other thing I would ask is well do you always listen to it and of course the answer to that was definitely no you know I learned that so much of what I was doing was false and I think I learned this see I, there's a reason that this came to me so clearly I was trying to understand why people did terrible things and I was really concentrating on the terrible, terrible things that people do. And I was interested in Auschwitz, for example, and, and not, in, not as a political phenomenon, but as a, as a psychological phenomenon. I was curious about how you could be an Auschwitz guard. Many people did many terrible things during the 20th century. And the idea that I was somehow better than them or that I should assume a priori that I was better than them and that I wouldn't have made the same choices or worse had I been in the same situation was a very, very, very dangerous supposition. And in fact, a sufficiently dangerous supposition to bring about the very danger that I assumed was worth avoiding. I, I had this idea, you know, that what had happened, especially in Nazi Germany, but also in, in the Soviet Union, shouldn't happen again that what we needed to do because of what happened in the 20th century 
especially because we also managed to create hydrogen bombs, that it was in that, and that we had become so technologically powerful that it, we, there wasn't time for that anymore. The time for that was over, and that we really needed to understand why it happened, and that perhaps we could go deep enough in that understanding so that you could stop it. Because if you if you understand a problem, maybe you can solve it, and. At least in part, I came to believe that the problem was, as Solzhenitsyn said, that the problem is, is that the line between good and evil runs down every human heart. And I re was reading Jung at the same time, you know, and he believed that the human soul was a tree whose roots grew all the way to hell. And believed also that in the full investigation of the shadow, which was the dark side of the human psyche, was that the, it was bottomless, essentially. That that, that it was like an experience of hell. And that also struck me as true. The way to stop those sorts of things from happening was to stop yourself from being the sort of person who would do it, who would even start to do it. For me, it was a matter of understanding that if we want this sort of thing to not happen anymore, then we have to start to become the sort of people who wouldn't do it which seems rather self-evident, all things considered, unless, you know, you believe that we're the pawns of social forces, for example, like the Marxists do. Um, and I don't believe that because we're also the creator of social forces. Um, and we're also capable of standing up to social forces because I would say the individual is more powerful than the social force, all things considered, interestingly enough, that the way to stop such things, to from happening, the way to remember properly is to understand that, that you could do it, that you could do those terrible things because the people who did them were like you. And that the way out of that is to stop being like that. And the way you stop being like that is, well, at least in part, by ceasing to tell yourself lies that you don't believe in and that you know you shouldn't act out and you know and that's made a huge difference in my life for better or for worse I mean it, it, it was very uncanny experience I would say because it's very discombobulating to experience yourself as fragmented enough so that much of what you do and say is actually false. It's a lot of work to clean that up. A lot. The consequences are, in principle, worthwhile. Understanding that was part of what drove me towards clinical psychology, say, and away from political science and law and from politics in general, because I started to believe that, and I think this is the great Western idea, which people were quite irritated about, by the way, on Q&A last night as well, that the proper route forward for the redemption of the individual and for mankind as a whole is as a consequence of the redemption of each individual. And I truly believe that. And I believe that that occurs as a consequence of adherence to the truth and courage in the face of being. That's rule one, right? To stand up straight with your shoulders back is to take on the onslaught and to enter the contentious ring and to do your to do and to do more than your best because your best isn't enough because your best isn't as good as you could be you have to push yourself past that and and that's as far as i can tell where you find what you need in life you find the meaning that sustains you in life and you find the patterns of action that redeem the world both at the same time i mean life is a very difficult business you know, it's, it's fatal and it's full of suffering and it's, and it's full of betrayal and malevolence. There's nothing about it that's trivial. It's all profound. And in order to find your way through all of that, that, that capacity for hellish experience, let's say, you need to develop a relationship with something that's profound. And you can, you have that capacity. And what could be more profound than the truth? And what would you rather have on your side? 
And you might say, well, that's obvious. And of course, everyone should do that. And then you need to know why you don't. And the answer is, well, the burns are still healing. It's like, well, you know, there's no shortage of dead wood to burn off. And, and there's no shortage of pain when the dead wood burns off. And that's what makes people afraid of the truth. You know, maybe that's why Moses encountered God in a burning bush. Who the hell knows? But there's something about that idea that seems to me to be the case. And so, what's the decision that you make? You know, you decide to believe. You know, it's a risk, an existential risk. It's an act of faith. You believe that the truth can set you free. You believe that people have an intrinsic divinity about their soul. You decide that you're going to live in that manner and that you're going to let everything about yourself that isn't worthy of that goal die. And that might be almost everything that you are. And that's a terrible thing to contemplate. The only thing that's worse I would say is the alternative because the alternative is the sorts of hells that we manage to produce around us and that we produced with particular expertise during the totalitarian regimes of the 20th century. And it would be a good thing if we decided collectively and individually not to go back there again.